Good morning. Good morning. morning. Welcome to Family Life Christian Center as we continue our study in the book of Revelations. We welcome you, those that are live in person, and thank you for joining us. If you're on the the internet with us, watching through uh, Facebook or YouTube, we welcome you as well. Uh, If you're joining us uh, from home or or, or from work or wherever, um, you can go to our uh, familylifespring.org website, click on the media tab, go down the book of Revelations and click on today's lesson. You can print off a copy of the worksheet that we'll be uh, utilizing today. We're going to be covering chapter 18. So um, before we do that, let's just go ahead and open up in prayer. Father God, we thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, for just allowing us to come together and and to pour over your word, Lord, to, uh, to go over the book of Revelations. Lord, we thank you that that you give us understanding. We thank you that you're explaining your word to us in a way that we can understand and, and how it makes sense to us. And, and uh, we just thank you that you're revealing uh, what's to come. So uh, help us to take this information and to just spread it to others, let them know uh, what's to come and to help others and encourage others to not be here when these things are happening <laughs> so we can be with you uh, at the rapture. So we thank you, Lord, for your love. We thank you for your mercy and your grace, Lord. We ask that you just be with us during this time. Open our ears to hear, Father. Open our eyes to see. And uh, may we just um, be blessed during this time because you said that uh, those that hear this word and do the word would be blessed. Uh, So, Lord, we just uh, ask for that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, thank you for joining us. Uh, Last week, uh, we talked about the destruction of the whore of Babylon. Uh, so this week, we're going to continue with that theme. Um, now, chapter 17 and this week's lesson, chapter 18, are interludes. And uh, so hopefully, it's starting to play out like a, like a novel for you. You're kind of seeing, uh, you know, the different characters in the book of Revelations. You're kind of seeing different perceptions, different viewpoints. Um, and that's kind of what these interludes are for, just to help us to understand some of these things that are going, uh, going on. Um, and because it's an interlude, uh, people have a hard time understanding the book of Revelations because they want to read it in chronological order, and it just doesn't make sense. So this is one of those chapters that's kind of filling in the gaps to help us to, under, to better understand what's going on, and, uh, and that's uh, what chapter 18 is about today. Uh, so chapter 18 describes the destruction of the city of Babylon. Now, what's interesting is when people hear that, they automatically think of the modern state or country of Iraq because that's where Babylon was. Now, I want you to understand that Babylon is used symbolically to refer to Rome. In fact, when the book of Revelation was written, Christians referred to Rome as Babylon. And I showed you that in the, uh, in the first book of uh, uh, Peter, chapter 5, verse number 13. So let's go ahead and uh, take a look at that. First Peter 5, 13. It says, Your sister church here in Babylon sends you greetings, and so does my son Mark. Now, Where was Peter when he wrote this book? He was in Rome. But in the first century, Christians referred to Rome as Babylon. Now, uh, why did they do that? Well, you see, in 586 A.D., the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem and the temple, and they carried the Jews into captivity. Then in 70 A.D., the Romans did the very same thing. So after 70 A.D., Christians started referring to Rome as Babylon, In fact, that was the code name for Rome. So in the book of Revelations, uh, Babylon is used symbolically to refer to the city of Rome. So when we read about the destruction of Babylon in chapter 18, what we're really reading about is the destruction of the city of Rome. Now, the reason that Rome is so important is because it's going to be the capital city of the revived Roman Empire. But more importantly, it's going to represent the political the religious, and the economic system of the beast. You see, during the last half of the tribulation, the beast is going to tie his political, his religious, and his economic policies together as part of his economic policy. People are going to have to take the mark if they want to buy and sell. So if you want to have a job, they're not going to be able to pay you unless you have the mark. If you want to go out and buy something, you're not going to be able to buy it unless you have the mark. So if you want to sell something, you're not going to be able to do that unless you have the mark. And as part of this, his religious policy, 
people are going to be required to worship the image of the beast. So his religious and his economic policies are going to be tied in together with his political policies. Does that make sense? Okay. We're seeing resemblances of that even today, aren't we? Yeah. So that's important. And the reason it's important is because as the capital city of the revived Roman Empire, Rome is going to represent the political, religious, and economic system of the beast. So this can be kind of confusing, and here's why I say that. Babylon really means Rome, and when we talk about Rome, it's the capital city of the revived Roman Empire. But we're really refer, uh, referring not just to the city of Rome, but also to this host system that the beast has set up. Are you tracking with me? All right. Now, the reason we say that is because it represents the system of the beast. Just like how Washington, D.C. is our nation's capital, and it represents the political system of the United States. However, Washington, D.C. does not represent our economic system, right? Wall Street, let me get that. Wall Street does that. So uh, our political, religious, and economic systems aren't tied together. At least they're not supposed to be. But when the beast comes on the scene, he's going to gain such authority and such power that he's going to actually tie his political and religious and economic policies all together. And the capital of his kingdom is going to be Rome. Now, why is that important? It's important because chapter 18 doesn't just des uh, describe the destruction of Rome. It, it also describes the destruction of that political, religious, and economic system of the beast. Now, I want you to think about this. We're going to get to the point uh, in chapter 18 where the kings are looking at the destruction of Babylon. In other words, Rome. And they're going to begin to lament or cry. And they're going to begin to wail as if it's, it wasn't just one city. Why would they do that? Because it's not just talking about the destruction of Rome, which it is. But Rome also represents a system. The system of the beast. Does that make sense? All right, good. Now, let me begin by giving you a basic outline of chapter 18 because I think if you can see how chapter 18 is laid out, it's going to help you understand exactly what you're reading. So here's the basic outline of chapter 18. In verses 1 through 3, an angel announces the fall of Babylon. In verses 4 through 8, believers are commanded to leave the city. In verse 4, it's the command to leave. Then in verses 5 through 8, the reason for God's judgment upon Babylon and why they need to leave. And then verses 9 through 19, three groups lament over Babylon's destruction. In verses 9 and 10, you had the kings of the earth lamenting over her destruction. And in verses 11 through 17a, you have the merchants lamenting over her destruction. And 17b through 19, you had the sea captains and the sailors lamenting over her destruction. And then, in verse number 20, there's a call for the heavens and all the saints to rejoice over the, the destruction of Babylon. And in verses 21 through 24, you have the destruction of Babylon. And basically, it's a visual picture of the destruction of Babylon, and it's given us finality. It's given us this overall sense that Babylon is never going to be raised up again. This system is dead and it's gone. So what I want to do is this. I want you to follow the outline as we go through uh, chapter 18. My hope is that you'll be able to make more sense of this as you read it later on. So the first three verses simply announces the fall of Babylon. So turn with me to Revelations chapter 18 verses 1 through 3. It says, after this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority, and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. Now, let me just say this. This is not Jesus Christ. In the book of Revelation, Jesus is not referred to as an angel. But I want you to notice something. This angel has great authority. That means he's in the presence of God. And if you remember, whenever Moses was in the presence of God in the tabernacle, when he came out, what happened to his face? His face almost glowed. It illuminated. So 
This is, uh, this is kind of giving us that very same picture. This is an angel with great authority. It means that he's in the presence of God. So when he comes, of course, the earth is going to be illuminated by his splendor because he has been in the presence of God. Verse 2, with a mighty voice he shouted, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling for demons and a haunt for every impure spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable animal. For all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her, and the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. <clears throat> now, I want you to notice that verse number one begins with, after this. In other words, after the seventh vial of God's wrath is poured out, after this, an angel announces that Babylon has fallen. In other words, Babylon has finally been destroyed. Now, the word fallen is written in the arrow's tense, which means that it has already happened. So when the seventh vial of God's wrath is poured out upon the earth, the earthquake is going to occur. And when that earthquake occurs, Babylon is going to be destroyed. Now, what the angel says next is very interesting. The angel says that Babylon has become a home for demons and a haunt for every evil spirit and a haunt for every unclean and detestable bird. Now, this can be interpreted in one of two ways. It can mean that Babylon has become a deserted place. It has been destroyed, and now it's deserted because in the Jewish tradition, demons and unclean spirits lived in deserted places. In fact, if you remember, when Jesus was teaching on demonic spirits, he talked about demonic spirits being cast out, and that they would go into a desert place, and they'd come back, and they would find a home that's been swept out and cleaned. They would, they would come and bring seven more wicked than themselves. You remember that story? Yeah. Well, that comes from Jewish tradition. So what they believe, or what some scholars believe, is that this is a result of her complete destruction. She's completely deserted, and that's all that that's saying. Now, the second interpretation is that this can mean that Babylon became a habitation for demons before her fall. That her abominable practices not only opened the door to demons, but they attracted demonic spirits, and that was one of the reasons that Babylon was judged. Now, I can tell you which interpretation is, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I can't tell you which interpretation is right, and the reason I can't tell you which is right is because because the way that it's written in the original Greek, the text can go either way. But I tend to think personally that the second interpretation is right. I believe that Babylon will become a habitation for demons and a haunt for every unclean spirit before she falls, and that will be one of the reasons that she's destroyed. And verse 3 tends to support that. So look at verse number 3. Revelation 18.3 says, For all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her, and the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. In other words, Babylon enticed the kings to participate in her immorality. She's the main culprit. She's willingly committed spiritual adultery, and then she enticed the other nations to commit adultery with her. Now, adultery and this is your first fill-in-the-blank in your worksheet, adultery represents idolatry in the Bible and in the book of Revelation. So adultery represents idolatry. It specifically refers to worshiping the image of the beast. So what this is saying is that she entices other nations to also worship the image of the beast. Now, Verse number three explains uh, the means by which she's going to entice all the kings of the earth to worship the image of the beast. She's going to use the promise of power and the enticement of wealth and luxury to get them to follow her lead. You see, there's something enticing about having prosperity. I don't know what it is about humans, but we'll do just about anything to get rich. <laughs> I see some heads kind of moving. <laughs> now, most of us have a line that we won't cross. Well, you know, I won't prostitute myself for money, or I won't sell drugs, or I won't rob a bank. But when large sums of money are placed in front of people, they'll do some very strange things to try to get that money. So when the beast comes in and he sets up his kingdom, he's going to set up a system in which people have to take the mark in order to buy and sell. And those who take the mark 
must worship the image of the beast. That, uh, that is the adultery that she participates in. But in order to be able to entice other kings uh, to come into the system and to buy and to sell into it, she's got to be able to offer them something. She's got to be able to entice them with something. And what we're going to find out is, uh, as we read through chapter 18, is that what she entices them with is wealth and luxury. It's such a wonderful thing to have all this prosperity. But my point is this. Worshiping the image of the beast opens the door to all types of demonic activity. That's why I believe that Babylon is going to become a habitation for demons before her destruction. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, in verses 4 through 8, believers are commanded to leave the city before she's destroyed. So, Revelation 18.4 says, Then I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her, <clears throat> in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. Now, this indicates that there's going to be a few believers who will make it to the very end of the tribulation without being martyred. And we'll, uh, we talked about this, and we'll talk about it more as we come up in uh, chapter 20. But we said that the majority of believers were, uh, were going to be martyred during the second half of the tribulation. In fact, a few are martyred in the first half of the tribulation, but just a few. Remember, they're, they're crying out from the Lord from the, underneath the altar. He tells them to wait until all the rest of them come in. The indication is that there's going to be this mass murder of Christians that's going to occur in the second half of the tribulation. And it's going to affect almost all believers. But there's going to be a few that are actually going to make it to the end of the tribulation. Not many, but a few. And those few are encouraged to leave the city. Now, I believe this applies to more cities than just Rome. And I'll tell you why I believe that. I believe that they're being told to leave every city that's a part of the revived Roman Empire. And the, re the reason I believe that is because if you remember, Rome is the capital of the revived Roman Empire. It represents the political, the religious, and the economic systems of the beast. But all of the other cities within the revived Roman Empire are going to be under the beast rule. So I believe that this is a command to leave any city within the revived Roman Empire. But he gives two reasons why they should leave. These two reasons would actually apply to anyone that's in any city that's in, within the, the revived Roman Empire. So let's look at the two reasons why. First one is the believers are told to leave so they won't share in her sins. You see, believers are going to be under constant pressure to take the mark of the beast and to worship the image simply because you can't buy or sell. You can't work. You can't do anything to provide for yourself or your family without doing that. And if they don't get out from underneath that pressure, they're eventually going to succumb to it. So what does the voice from heaven tell them? He tells them to leave the city so they won't share in her sin. In other words, so they won't give in to the pressure. And the second reason that, they, that they're told to leave is so they won't receive any of her plagues. In other words, they won't be there when her destruction comes. Now, if you're in the city when the seventh vial of God's wrath is poured out, you're going to be destroyed right along with Babylon because the host city is going to be wiped out. So, we could look at this and we could say, well, this voice from heaven is just telling the believers to get out of Rome. But when I look at the other reason and they're told to leave, which, which is that they could possibly share in the same, uh, same sin that they're going to be in underneath, I come to the conclusion what this voice from heaven is telling them is to get out from any of the cities that's underneath the rule of the beast. Now, verses 5 through 8, he explained the reason for God's judgment coming upon her. So take a look at verses 5 through 8. It says, For her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. Give back to her as she has given. Pay her back double for what she has done. Pour, for her, pour her a double portion from her own cup. Give her as much torment and grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself. In her heart she boasts, I sit enthroned as queen. I am not a widow. I will never mourn. Therefore, in one day, her plagues will overtake her, death, mourning, and famine. She will be consumed by fire, for mighty is the Lord God who judges her. Now, 
Verse five tells us that her sins are piled up to heaven. In other words, her sins were so many and they were so great that if you were to pile them up one on top of the other, they would reach all the way to heaven. That's a lot of sins. <laughs> so verse six is simply the law of retribution. In other words, the punishment fits the crime. Here's your next fill in the blank. She's, she's going to get exactly what she deserves. Now, when you read these verses, when you get to verse six and you read verses seven and eight, it seems at first glance that she's receiving a greater punishment than what she deserves because it says to pay her back double for what she has done. Now, when we hear that, the first thing we think of is that means twice as much. Pay her back double, give her twice as much. But that's not what God means by pay her back double for what she has done. You see, the word double is translated from the Greek word diplos, and it means double in the sense that it's an identical twin, is a double or, you know, from, for, uh, of a sibling. So if we brought identical twins up here, we took one and we said, this is so-and-so, then we would look at the other one and say, this is her double. What do we mean by that? We mean that they look exactly alike. That's an exact copy of her sister, right? So that's what verse number six is saying, is to make sure she gets exactly what she deserves. In other words, she did these sins, and this is her punishment. Does that make sense? So you make sure that you make an exact copy, that she gets that this punishment exactly what she deserves. Now, when her destruction comes upon her, it's going to be a huge shock. There's going to be a huge shock to the beast. It's going to be a huge shock to everyone that's in this system because Rome or Babylon thinks that she's invincible. Look at the last part of verse number seven. It says, in her heart she boasts, I sit enthroned as queen. I am not a widow. I will never mourn. Now, I want you to notice her attitude. First of all, she boasts that she's a queen. Now, why wouldn't she say, I'm a king? Because when you refer to a city, it's referred to in the feminine gender. New York is a she. London is a she. So when you refer to cities, you always refer to them in the feminine gender. So what she's saying is, when she says, I'm a queen, is that I rule the world. No one can take me down. Secondly, she makes the boast that she's not a widow. Now, we really don't understand this statement because we never really lived in a culture where it's such a hardship to be a widow. But you need to understand that in the ancient world, becoming a widow was the fear of every woman. It was the fear of every woman because it was difficult to make it in their culture without having a male provider and a male protector. And Babylon here sees that the beast as her husband. She's the city. She's the capital. She's the queen. And the beast, the system, it's her husband. And she thinks that she can't be whittled. In other words, she believes that the beast is invincible. There's her next fill in the blank. She believes that the beast is invincible, that he cannot be conquered. And as a result of that, she's shocked when she goes down. And last but not least, she boasts that she will never mourn. So for these reasons, she's going to be destroyed. So let's go over those reasons one more time. It says, first thing is she, be, she became a habitation for demonic spirits and a haunt for every unclean spirit. Second thing is she committed spiritual adultery and enticed others to commit adultery with her. What was the adultery? She worshiped the image of the beast and she enticed others to worship the image of the beast. And she used her wealth and she used her power to entice other nations to do the same thing. Three, her sins are so great and so many that the reason he just left it at that is because you could go into where she martyred the saints. They did this, they did that. But instead of listing out the sins, he just came and said that her sins are so many and so great that if you were piled them on top of each other, they would reach the heavens. The fourth thing is she boasted that she can't be destroyed. For these reasons, she's going to be destroyed in one hour, in one day. In fact, it says in one day, but when you get to the very end, it says in one hour. And what that means is suddenly. Look at verse number eight. 
Here we see the, the one day. We'll get into the one hour in just a little bit. So Revelation 18, verse 8 says, Therefore, in one day, her plagues will overtake her, death, mourning, and famine. She will be consumed by fire, for mighty is the Lord God who judges her. Now, when she's destroyed, three groups are going to lament over her destruction. That's in verses 9 through 19. So let's break it up into three different groups because they all lament over her for different reasons. The first group is mentioned, uh, that's mentioned is found in verses 9 and 10. It says, When the kings of the earth who committed adultery with her and shared her luxuries see the smoke of her burning, they will weep and mourn over her. So why the smoke of her burning? Because she is going to be on fire. This earthquake occurs, and she's going to be totally demolished. Then you're going to see the rubble and the smoke from the rubble coming up. And you can see all the fires caused by all the electrical problems and the down power lines. So they see all this destruction and smoke coming up. So that's when they see the smoke of her burning. And they're going to weep and mourn over her. Verse 10, terrified at her torment, they will stand far off and cry, Woe, woe to you, great city, the mighty city of Babylon. In one hour, your doom has come. Now, the reason they weep over her destruction is twofold. First of all, since they committed adultery with her, they actually feel like they're losing a lover. But I would say it this way. They're losing a partner in crime. It's kind of like when you see someone doing something you know they shouldn't do, but boy, it looks pretty lucrative. And after a while, you realize, huh, they're not going to get caught. So you join in. And then just, you just happen to be at a different place at a different time, as you're pulling up and you see that they're being arrested, and the first thing you do is stand far off because you don't want to be a part of that, <laughs> right? <laughs> but you're also wondering, who knows that I participated in that too? <laughs> and that's basically what these kings are doing. The second reason that they weep over her is because they lived a sensuous lux in sensuous luxury with her, and as a result of her, and now she's gone. So they're losing the wealth and the power that they received as a result of giving in to her enticements. And here's what I really want you to understand. The beast kingdom is going to bring such economic prosperity and wealth to these kings that it's going to be hard for any nation in the world to literally say no to it. And one of the reasons why is because of the policies that he's going to implement. The mark, of, uh, the mark that he gives to the people in order for them to be able to buy or sell is going to be seen as a good thing in, in an economic sense, not in a spiritual sense. Now, I don't want anyone going out and saying that I said that the mark of the beast is going to be good. <laughs> it's not, okay? So that's not what I'm saying. I just want you to understand with, uh, with our technology and the capabilities of modern medicine, people are going to see this as a good thing because this mark, possibly some type of implanted chip, will prevent identity theft, making banking easier and allow for overall conveniences that we're already seeing today. I wouldn't be surprised if there was some type of biometric component to this to make certain that it's you and it can't be counterfeited. But it will be a cashless society, and we already see that. We see that in the making, right? Um, you won't be able to buy or sell without it. So this begs the question, how will this benefit the kings? Well, no more tax fraud. They will be able to get all their piece of the pie. That makes sense? The way the system works, you can't fudge it on your taxes. So these kings are going to become very wealthy under this system. So when Babylon is destroyed, so is their gravy train. Remember, Babylon isn't just a city. Babylon is also an economic system. It's the economic system of the beast. And when this capital city is destroyed, it means the economic system of the beast is also destroyed and that means that their gravy train is gone. So the kings are looking back at this and they realize, man, this is a good, this is a thing of God. But at the same time, they're going, it's gone. Our wealth, our luxury, all that we had is gone. Now, the second group that laments over her destruction are the merchants. So look at verses 11 through 17. So 
Revelations 18, verse 11 through 17. The merchants of the, of the earth will weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore. Cargoes of gold, silver, precious stones and pearls, fine linen, purple, silk, and scarlet cloth, every sort of citron wood, and articles of every kind made of ivory, costly wood, bronze, iron, and marble, cargoes of cinnamon and, spi and, yeah, and spice, of incense, myrrh, and frankincense, of wine and olive oil, of fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and carriages, and human beings sold as slaves. They will say, the fruit you, you long for is gone from you. All your luxury and splendor have vanished, never to be recovered. The merchants who sold these things and gained their, their wealth from her will stand far off, terrified at her torment. They will weep and mourn and cry out, woe, woe to you, great city, dressed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. In one hour, such great wealth has been brought to ruin. Every sea captain and all who traveled by ship, the sailors and all who earn their living from the sea will stand far off. So, all of these merchants who became wealthy in the revived Roman Empire are going to lament over her destruction. Many of the scholars believe that the wealth of the future Rome is going to be much like ancient Rome and when you go back to ancient Rome and you look at her, uh, when she was at the pinnacle of her power, it is amazing the extravagant luxuries that they had in the city of Rome. They were basically bringing things from every part of the known world at that time. Did you know that they had actually brought things from China? Kind of like Amazon. <laughs> so they brought things from India, from China, from North Africa, and from the Middle East. They brought things from all over the world, and it's going to be the very same way again. So these merchants who have become wealthy because of the revived Roman Empire are going to lament over her destruction. But it's not because they care for her. The reason they're going to lament is because no one's going to buy their cargoes anymore. In fact, that's what verse 11 says. They cry out because no one's going to buy their cargoes anymore. And then John begins to list in verses 12 and 13 all the things that they sold. Now, his list grouped into six different categories. So you have precious stones and metals, luxurious fabrics, expensive wood and building materials, spices and perfumes, food and animals, and notice that last one, and slaves. That's kind of interesting. I think the reason that he goes into such depth is because he wants you to understand that we're not just talking about one or two things. We're talking about a system where they're bringing in all these things from all over the world. It's all about supply and demand, and there is such a demand for them. But the most inter interesting thing is the last part, slaves. In fact, in the original Greek, it talks about human souls. But the reason that says animals and human souls is because it's emphasizing that in this particular culture, they're going to see slaves as animals. In fact, I don't know if you realize this, but when Rome was at the pinnacle of its power, they had so many different slaves, it was a status symbol. They referred to their slaves as talking tools, thinking tools. They did not see them as human souls. So it's telling us that there's going to be, become such welfare that they're literally going to begin to bring people in and use them as slaves. Remember, there's going to be a famine you remember that when we talked about that from the early chapters of uh, Revelation? The middle class will disappear. You'll either be wealthy or poor. And it will cost a day's wage just for a loaf of bread. So the slave trade will be alive and well. But you can also see why other nations are enticed to become a part of it. We're talking about economic prosperity that we've never seen before. Now, now that we have such a, a global economy, when you have one part of the globe that's beginning to have such prosperity, everyone wants to be part of it. Think of it as how the United States was during its economic heyday, and to some extent, even today. People are coming in in droves to be here. So the kingdom of the beast, talking about the revived Roman Empire, doesn't mean it's going to be over the entire world, but it will entice all of the other nations to want to be a part of it. So when Babylon falls, the merchants are going to weep over her for one simple reason. There's no one to buy their goods. And then it says it happens 
in one hour. This earthquake from the seventh vial of God's wrath is going to totally wipe out the city of Babylon almost instantly. Look at verses 15 and 16. It says, They will weep and mourn and cry out, Woe, woe to you, great city, dressed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. In one hour, such great wealth has been brought to ruin. Notice this is the perception of the merchants. They don't think about all those poor people that died in that city. They're not thinking that way. They're thinking in dollar signs. Did you notice that? In one hour, such great wealth has been brought to ruin. Sometimes we get caught up in that kind of thinking when one of those hurricanes wipes out our favorite summer destination. We think of terms of, oh man, how soon can they rebuild so we can make plans to get back there? <laughs> we don't think about all those poor people that lost everything. So, and that's how these merchants are thinking when this city is destroyed. The first thing they think is, man, in one hour, such great wealth has been brought to ruin. Now, the third group that laments over her destruction is found in the last part of verse number 17 through 19. It says, Every sea captain and all who travel by ship, the sailors and all who earn their, their living from the sea, will stand far off. When they see the smoke of her burning, they will exclaim, Was there ever a city like this great city? They will throw dust on their heads and with weeping and mourning cry out, Woe, woe to, to you, great city, where all who, who had ships on the sea became rich through her wealth. In one hour, she has been brought to ruin. Now, the third group are the sea captains, the sailors, and every person who makes their living transporting materials throughout the Mediterranean Sea and throughout all the oceans are going to lose their livelihood when Babylon is destroyed. You see, they became wealthy from Babylon, and now it's gone. So when you're reading through chapter 18, and you're reading about these last three groups lamenting over Babylon, when you get to the very end of that part, you immediately think uh, that it's going to talk about the destruction of Babylon, but it doesn't. One group is going to rejoice over the destruction of Babylon. Who's going to rejoice over the destruction of Babylon? Yeah, the Christians, but... We're, uh, where are those Christians going to be? Are, they going to? are there going to be many Christians left on the earth? No. Most of them are going to be raptured. Uh, they're going to be raptured out, and the ones who became saved afterwards, they're going to be martyred. So you're going to have, you'll have a few that's left. So who's going to be rejoicing? Those in heaven. Look at verse 20. Revelations 18, 20. Rejoice over her, you heavens. Rejoice, you people of God. Rejoice, apostles and prophets, for God has judged her with the judgment she imposed on you. Now, at first, it might seem kind of offensive to rejoice over the, the destruction of all these cities, and especially this one big city and all the people that must have died as a result, until you remember who Babylon represents. Babylon is Rome, and as the capital city of the revived Roman Empire, she represents the political, the religious, and the economic system of the beast. The same system that murdered the saints. The same system that required all of its citizens to worship the beast. The same system that blasphemies God and refused to repent of their sins. So this judgment is just and it's fair. God's saints are finally going to be vindicated and divine justice is finally going to be served and the heavens rejoice over this because God cannot set his kingdom up on the earth until his judgment comes, and this is his judgment coming. Then chapter 18 ends with a visual picture of the destruction of Babylon. So let's read verses 21 through 24 because this is a beautiful picture. Then a mighty angel picked up a boulder the size of a large millstone and threw it into the sea and said, With such violence... The great city of Babylon will be thrown down, never to be found again. So what could destroy a city like that? That great earthquake. Verse 22, the music of harpists and musicians, pipers and trumpeters will never be heard again, will never be heard in you again. No worker of any trade will ever be found in you again. The sound of a millstone will never be heard in you again. 
the light of a lamp will never shine in you again. The voice of the bridegroom and bride will never be heard in you again. Your merchants were the world's uh, important people. By your magic spell, all the nations were led astray. In her was found the blood of prophets and of God's holy people, of all who had been slaughtered on the earth. So as I said, this is a great picture of what's going to take place. In fact, verse number 21 is a great picture of what's going to happen when Babylon is destroyed. It says, this angel picks up a huge boulder the size of a millstone and throws it into the sea. Now, the millstones that we're talking about is not the, the small stones that women use with their hands when they would prepare a meal for one. No, it's talking about two large millstones that had to be turned by oxen. So it's the type of millstone that would weigh several tons. So he picks up this boulder that weighs several tons, and he throws it into the sea. Now, here's what's interesting. Whenever you throw a boulder like that into the sea, you can't pull it out. It's there for good. I'm not saying with modern technology, we wouldn't be able to go down there and pick up that boulder, but in, in the picture in John's day, when you threw a boulder like that into the sea, what it meant is it's over. It's there. You can't bring it out. And so it's there for good, and that's the point. He's given a visual picture of what's going to happen to Babylon when it's destroyed. It will never rise again. It's over for good. Now, if you remember when we looked at the seven heads upon the beast, we said that every one of those heads represent a kingdom that persecuted Israel. It started all the way back with Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medes and Persians, Greece, then Rome. If you remember, when one empire would be destroyed, another empire would come and take its place. You know what he's telling us here? This is it. When God destroys this last empire, when he destroys the kingdom of the beast, there's not going to be another evil one that takes its place. This time, Jesus Christ is going to return, and he's going to set up his kingdom on the earth, and we're never again going to have that kingdom or any kingdom like it to ever set up on the earth again. And to drive the point home, he starts giving the examples of everyday life that will no longer exist and will never exist again in Babylon. Musicians will never be heard again in Babylon. No craftsman or any trade will ever work in Babylon again. No one will ever prepare food in Babylon again. There will never be any more homes in Babylon. And that's what's meant by lamps. Those lamps he's talking about are those little, lamp, those little bitty lamps that would, would uh that would light up when you'd place them in your homes at night. So no one would ever experience the joy of being married in Babylon again. Now, why does he say in Babylon? Because people will live on the earth. And we're going to find that out when we get to the millennium, that we're going to live on the earth. We're going to experience all of these things. Musicians are going to be there, craftsmen. But Babylon represents all of these world empires that were against God. It represents the system of the beast who's empowered by the devil. And Babylon is going to be gone forever when it's destroyed. Now, here's the interesting thing. When Rome is destroyed and the cities are destroyed, there's going to be those who escape. Maybe they weren't killed and they come to this valley of Armageddon. And when they're there at the valley of Armageddon, they're still defiant. There's no way this is going to be taken from them. We're going to find out in chapter 19 that Jesus Christ returns. But that's chapter 18, and hopefully with the lesson notes, you can read through it on your own and understand it a little bit better. All right. Anybody have any questions over chapter 18? Oh, we got questions, comments? We're getting, we're getting near the end, folks. We're getting near the end. So I'm wondering how it's going to go with, because in chapter 16, it said with the second angel poured out the bowl, uh, his bowl on the sea where it turned to blood. How are the ships going to have, how are they going to have ships and sailors in a bloody that, sea? That is a great question. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it'll be fluid enough for the ships to still travel. Uh, but yeah, uh, it's going to be a, It'll be a mess. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. I, I wondered that whenever I saw that. I'm like, how are these merchants going to travel if the oceans and seas and everything turn to blood? But 
uh, I guess there'll be a way. Anybody else have any questions, comments? Okay. Okay, we got You know, watching all this portray out and all, the, all of the evil going to Babylon, it sounds like a trap, that God is placing a trap for all of the demons to congregate in this one area, and once they're all there, it's completely destroyed with every one of them in it. All the cities, all of that is like a big, huge trap. That's a good point. That's an uh, interesting observation. <laughs> uh, Paul, you got something? Hold on, here comes a microphone for you. Yeah, I was checking to see if you'd heard of any connection between uh, where you're talking about revived Roman Empire and then you're mentioning Rome involved with that, but any correlation or connection with the European Union? I do see similarities, uh, and it, it, I see the, for me, I see kind of the beginnings uh, of that. You know, whether it's, yeah, already having the coalition, you know, um, you know, the World Economic Forum, the, you know, the, the WHO, the NATO, all that, it just makes me kind of perk up a little bit and kind of try to pay attention to what they're doing, what's going on, because uh, somehow that's all going to be, I think, tied in. Yes, and that and what's interesting about London is that they've been letting all these you know Muslims come in and you know and that's what I said uh, in one of the lessons back you know about the United States is how with the immigration coming in that's how the Muslims are going to change the world is from the inside out because they know they can't do it from the outside coming in and force their way in so they're going to come in and just kind of do uh, make changes from the inside out and we see that happening. A place like London, we we have been seeing it here. Uh, we've got uh, Muslims that are in office, and they're making changes and uh, and standing for certain policies that have go, goes against all the Judeo Christian values. So, I was I was thinking, you know, when you're talking about the city, there'll be only the uh, demons and the uh, you know wild type animals. I, I can't. I was looking at. I can't think of Will Smith's movie. What's that movie? Le I, oh, am I am legend. <laughs> how the yeah. how those things are certainly demonic, have to be or can only come out of dark. They hide in the dark, and yeah. uh, don't come out. You know, and all the wild type of beasts. And there's every, everything's gone in the city. It's just, yeah. I just thought about that. I mean, I'm sure there's nothing coalition, but it's kind of the same in the sense that <laughs> yeah. there's the demons, right? And there's uh, you know the light and dark, and nobody's there. And yeah, but as uh, we're gonna see in the upcoming. Uh, chapters that, you know, they're, they're going to be, uh, uh, all the demons, Satan, Lucifer, all of them, they're, they're going to be where they belong. Um, and uh, it's, things will revert back to the way they originally were intended to be uh, before the fall. So we're going to get to that uh, here in the upcoming chapters. But yeah, we are getting pretty close. We're, we're seeing the end of it. We already, you know, we've, we've seen a lot that's like, wow, it's, you know, there's a lot to talk about with our friends and neighbors, right? A lot, uh, you know, a lot to discuss with them on why you don't want to physically be here, you know, after the rapture. You want to make sure that you're you're with uh, with the saints in the rapture, not having to go through uh, a lot of this mess and turmoil, because it's going to be bad. It's going to be really bad. If we think things are you know getting tough now, this is nothing. Yeah, this is nothing. So, all right. Anybody else have anything? Any comments? Questions? All right. So next week we'll be uh, continuing on with chapter 19. Uh, and that's going to be that's going to be a great lesson. It's going to be a two part lesson, so it's going to be two weeks worth, um, because that's where we see the Battle of Armageddon. We see Jesus Christ returns, so it's uh, it's going to be a lot of good stuff. I mean, it's all good stuff, but you know that's that's the the, the climactic battle that we've all been anticipating. Is we've we've all heard about this the Battle of Armageddon, and we'll get there. Um, uh, and we're going to see Jesus return, and that's going to be amazing to see. That's what we're all hoping for. We're all looking for because when He returns uh, at the rap, you know, uh, we're going to be with Him because we're going to be raptured up, and then we're going to be coming back with Him. So there's a lot to discuss, a lot to explain in regards to uh, to that um, the, the the marriage supper of the Lamb, marriage supper of God. It's it's all going to be. Uh, there's a there's a lot to explain. <laughs> So even though we're getting close, we're getting to the final chapters, there's still a lot of lessons within those few chapters. So um, 
So we still got a little ways to go, but it's going to be good. So let's go ahead and close in prayer. Father God, we thank you for what you're showing us and what you're teaching us. We thank you for your word. Lord, uh, may it be a light unto our feet, Lord, and uh, just help us to, uh, to be able to, to talk to others, to be able to explain uh, what we're learning in Revelation, to, uh, to help others to understand that, uh, that they want to be with you at the rapture. They, they want to be with you in heaven one day. And, um, and I believe, Lord, that we are the generation that we're, that we're going to see all this play out, God. So I pray that you prepare our hearts for that. Uh, prepare us um, to, uh, to, uh, to be uh, the, the ones calling uh, light into the darkness uh, uh, for these last days. Lord, we thank you for, your t- for just being with us, Lord. We thank you for your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Uh, we'll see you all here at uh, 1030 for service. God bless you.